Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences Virtual Bug Fest. My name is Greg Scoopian, and I have the privilege and honor of being the host of the very first program in this week's lineup of events. Before we get started, a quick shout out to our sponsor, BASF. Thank you so much for supporting the programming here this week. And of course, thank you to all of our uh, friends of the museums, our members who have supported us continuously, especially during the pandemic. For those of you joining in Zoom, we're going to go over a quick Zoom tutorial. First of all, we ask that you keep yourself muted so we don't interrupt our speakers here today. If you need captions, you can click on the CC button there at the bottom of your screen and then hit show subtitle. If you need to adjust the font size, you can go into accessibility and you'll see that you can make them smaller or larger. And for best viewing, we recommend using the speaker view at the top of the screen. You can select speaker view and then show side by side, which is going to allow you to see the PowerPoint slides and our speaker at the same time. And you can uh, adjust the size of those screens by clicking on the vertical bar and dragging it to the left or right. And we want to have you engage, asking great questions. To do that, we're gonna use the chat both in YouTube and in Zoom. We just ask that you're a good digital citizen. Let's keep things relevant and on topic. To get that chat going, we're gonna drop a question in there right now. Uh, we wanna know if you had to design a study looking at individual bees, how would you keep track of all those bees? How can you tell them apart? Drop your answers in there. We'll get that chat going right now. So I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Adrian Smith. He is the head of our evolutionary biology and behavior research lab at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. And he is going to introduce our very first speaker for this week's events. Go ahead, take it away, Adrian. All right, thanks. Hey everybody, welcome to BugFest. It's gonna be awesome this year. Thanks for joining on this first day in the morning. So I get to introduce Dr. Adam Dolezal. And the reason why I volunteered to introduce uh, Dr. Dolezal is because I've known him for a very long time. I've known him since before he studies, before he ever studied bees actually. Um, so much so that I keep this picture uh, at my desk and I'm the one in the goofy hat in the back. And there's our first speaker uh, more than a decade ago on a field trip in Arizona to study ants of the Southwest. So before he worked on bees, he actually worked on ants. Um, but today, uh, he's not going to talk about ants, I don't think. I think he's going to talk about bees and bee health. And so what he studies now, um, for a while now, uh, all the way from as a postdoc in, in Iowa State um, to a professor in the Department of Entomology at University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, um, where I used to work, actually. Uh, he studies uh, honeybee health and how it interacts with human crop systems. So today he's going to talk about how do bees deal with disease, dealing with life in a very close family. And with that, I will introduce Dr. Adam Dolzo. Take it away. Great. Thanks for that. Um, great introduction. Let's see if I can get my screen sharing to work. Does everything look okay? Can someone, Adrian or Greg, give me a nod if it, if it looks yeah, okay? Yeah, looks good. All right, great. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Uh, thanks again for that intro. Like Adrian said, I started my scientific career working on harvester ants, um, but since about 2012, I've worked mostly on honeybees and other bee species. Um, and also such a great icebreaker question because we'll see how I answer that question throughout the talk and we'll do it in a couple of different ways. One of which we see right here um, in the introduction slide. So um, like Adrian mentioned, one of the things that we work on in my lab um, that I run out of the University of Illinois and the bee research facility we have here um, is how honeybees deal with all the different stresses they encounter in their environment, whether it's agrochemicals or nutritional problems um, or uh, agricultural practices. And so, um, but for today, I wanna talk specifically about pathogens. Um, like all or our organisms deal with pests and pathogens and honeybees are no exception. So before I, I jump into talking about the types of pathogens we work on, I want to give what I call a refresher on honeybees or why is this so complicated? And so 
<clears throat> I find even among professional entomologists who haven't worked on, on social insects, they are not ready for some of the weird um, challenges that we face and complexities we face when dealing with these social animals. And so we can really view honeybees as, as little individual bees that go about their business, but they're really all each part of a super organism, this huge colony that is filled with thousands and thousands of worker bees, a single queen that does all the reproduction, and then some drones, the male bees that I really won't talk much about today. And so each colony is this unit with tons and tons of individuals. And then within the colony, we have both adult bees, as well as bees who are being raised from the eggs that the queen lays. Um, many people are familiar with royal jelly and the, the larval, larval bees are fed on this. They grow up, pupate and become an adult bee. And then the cycle kind of continues. And of course, when we think about what's going on outside the colony, we know that bees live in, live in hives, they live in, in nests, and then they fly out into nature and collect food. And so one of the other problems that we have in understanding bee, honeybees is where the heck are they going all the time? So when a, bee, when a bee worker leaves a colony, she can forage for in sometimes up to five or 10 miles. Rarely does that actually happen, but the point of this is that they have huge potential for interacting with just stuff in the environment. To go back to our um, rice river question, here we can actually see some of these bees on this photo are, are paint marked. So they have little blue dots on them that probably tells us how old they are. <clears throat> and so honeybees, like many different animals, especially agricultural ones, deal with a lot of different types of pests and pathogens. And the most famous and detrimental of these is vir are the varroa mites. We can see a bee pupa here has a bunch of these little mites on them. And to the bee, they're not so little. They're pretty darn big, actually. They bite the bees and they feed upon um, their fat stores inside their body. But more importantly, they transmit viruses, just like a mosquito can transmit um, can transmit malaria to us, um, viruses can be transmitted from these mites to the bees. And so with some viruses, the bees then emerge with deformations, like this worker here has no wings, highly messed up wings, they can be very small. And so there's this complicated um, virus mite complex that we see going on all the time. And this has become a major problem in managed bees, um, as well as feral bees um, in lots of parts of the world as these diseases um, become spread more and more quickly. And so one of the main things I wanted to talk about today was thinking about bees in the context of being social insects, because social insect colonies like bees and ants and termites, they present some real advantages if you're a pathogen, right? We've got this colony of tens of thousands of individuals. They're all touching each other all the time. They're constantly licking each other, spitting food in and out. Um, and if you're a pathogen, it becomes very easy to move between those individuals. <clears throat> so most social insects, including honeybees, have to have specialized defenses to deal with these diseases. Just like we have an immune system inside of our bodies, bees have one too. It works a bit differently. They don't have antibodies. Um, their system of acquired immunity is different. But social insects, I think one of the things that makes them super cool is that they deal, with, um, they deal with diseases in a very different way, which is through behaviors. And so a lot of them have some different, different kinds of specialized behaviors to prevent diseases from ravaging the colony. And we see this across lots of social in insects with some level of socialness. We have um, ants and termites that groom each other constantly, um, grooming of eggs to keep fungal spores off of them. Some insects produce antimicrobial secretions that kill pathogens. Um, and a lot of them also can detect when a bee or, um, or ant or whatever is ill, is sick, and remove it from the colony. Get, get that diseased one out of here. We call this social immunity. And this can exist, you usually think of this existing within a colony. This is a bee, this is bees or ants, or wasps doing something to prevent pathogens from being spread within their own colony. But we also have specialized defenses between colonies. And so this is um, what sometimes is, is called guard or soldier behavior. And this means this is when bees or ants or whatever have special individuals who just hang out at the front of the colony. 
And if a foreign bee comes into comes it tries to come in, they get kind of accosted and attacked. So preventing them from coming in. And that plays a role in, in defending the colony in a, a couple of different ways. And so what we were interested in was two questions, both how does disease spread within a colony? If we mark all the individual worker bees and we have some that are infected and some that are not, what happens? How do the bees respond to that infection and how would a disease actually get transmitted between these thousands of individuals that are constantly touching each other? And then we also wanted to know how does disease spread between colonies? Because if a disease would just stay inside one colony and not spread, it would be a lot easier to control. But that's not what we see. We see that if a single colony becomes infected and they're in a, inside of a group of colonies, that disease obviously can spread between them. So I'm gonna pause here for kind of like a pop quiz and question for people in the chat. I want you to look at these different pictures that I presented, A, B, C, D, E, and F, and think about which one of these is not a honeybee nest or hive. This will be important as we think about how diseases spread between colonies to understand what are the different types of places that honeybees live and where do they not live. So I'll pause a moment there. People can enter in the chat what they think and why. And if, if you know what things are, shout them out. And, um, and if anybody has, yeah, go ahead, please. We have a lot of votes for C right now. A couple of A's and E's coming in as well. All right. Give it 10 more seconds. All right. Well, I'm happy to see a lot of C's. The makers of the 1990s movie, My Girl, clearly didn't have the expertise of our viewers here. That's kind of a dated reference, but that's okay. But you're correct. Uh, C is a European hornet nest. But as we often see depicted um, in movies, TV and diagrams, often is a picture <clears throat> and people think, oh, that's that big hanging thing off the tree. That's a beehive, that's a bee nest. In fact, at my kids' daycare, they named the classrooms after insects and the honeybees to my chagrin is just a picture of a wasp nest that says honeybees on it. It's just like, but no, all these others are, are with one exception, are traditional bee colonies. Um, the first is a basket. They're called skep hives, traditional European method. In Asia, these are actually as a photo I took in Asia. It looks like I thought a window unit air conditioner, but it's a like a very kind of easily made bark hive. A hollowed log is a common system also still found in Asia. The ancient Greeks and Romans used clay pots to keep bees in. And of course, this is what a colony looks like in nature. Most importantly, honeybees live in hollow tree cavities in similar places, sometimes very, very high up in a tree kind of out by themselves. Because how many trees have holes in them, right? But we're most used to seeing them in a situation like this, right? A bunch of white boxes kept on some stands by a beekeeper and managed for honey production or managed for um, crop pollination. This is especially the case here in the United States where honeybees are a non-native species. They were brought over by European settlers 500 years ago. And since then have become really common in the, in the surrounding landscape. But again, they're not native, they're introduced as a managed species. <clears throat> so to kind of return back to my story about the disease system, uh, one of the things, one of the viruses that is spread by varroa mites and one that we work on a lot in my lab is called Israeli acute paralysis virus. So this is a virus that when adult bees become infected with it, they become paralyzed and they do this kind of shaking behavior um, and eventually they die. We also know that bees often can be infected with this without those symptoms and just be carrying it around and it's just running in the background. One of the challenges in studying honeybee viruses, is how do we get the viruses and how do we actually use them? Um, and so one of the things that we've been working on, it's been about 10 years now we've been using this method, is we actually carefully remove the pupae from inside the colony before they're very developed and we inject a very small amount of virus particles into them. The viruses then ampli ampli amplify a ton and then we can extract them out. And so we can um, produce these like little virus factories that make a bajillion virus particles that we can then use to experimentally infect the bees, which is really nice because it's, it's hard to work with this in a system where you're not doing a manipulation. 
And so we wanted to know how does infection affect, how does infection with this virus in particular affect behavior? And we have two hypotheses. One is that because bees need to um, reduce pathogen transmission within their colony, we're gonna see behavioral changes to reduce the impact and transmission of pathogens. Like we see in other social insects, maybe when they're sick, they clean themselves more or they spend more time cleaning their nest. Our second hypothesis is what we call host manipulation. And this is present in a lot of different systems as well, including a lot of insects, where a pathogen basically takes over the body of its host and makes the host do stuff that should help the pathogen, not the host. Some of the famous examples are the zombie ants that are filled with this cordyceps fungus um, or bacula virus in some types of caterpillars where they, once they become infected, they crawl up to the tops of the canopy of a tree and then they just die there. And then their rotten body parts just fall down on the caterpillars below them, spreading the virus around. They normally would not do that, but because they're infected, they do. So these two hypotheses. And the cool thing is because social um, insects live within a super organism, these don't have to be mutually exclusive. They can occur at the same time. We have a context within the colony, and then we have a context of between colonies. And so we might expect both of these things to be happening at the same time. It just depends on where you look and how you look. And so I just wanted to show a little bit on how we infect the bees. It seems very simple, but boy, is it a lot of trouble to do. Anybody who works in my lab can tell you that. Um, but it looks very simple. We basically create all these cages and we put bees in there for about a day. And during this time in this controlled cage, we feed them sugar water that has virus mixed into it. And so they're just ingesting the virus particles. And here we can see just a little short video of what this looks like. Um, this is from a grad student in my lab named Ed Shea, who is infecting these bees. We put the food in these little dishes. The bees love sugar water, as you might expect. And so they just kind of drink it, um, sometimes within about 15 minutes. Uh, because bees are social, they share food between each other. So we leave them in there about 15, uh, I don't know, 12 to 15 hours to make sure they spread the virus mix all around. So they all get very infected. This is just kind of showing a different picture of the setup. So how do we see how they behave? How would you mark individual bees so you know who's who? So when I worked on ants, we did it in a very simple way, which was either putting a dot of paint on them, or I would tie these little metal wires around their uh, little waists, with different colors. But um, when I started doing this work, I got um, involved working with a much more complicated and fancy technologically advanced system that had been developed um, by another lab here at the U of Illinois, um, led by a, a computer scientist and kind of moonlighting biologist named Tim Gernot. And so this is a system they call barcoding or bee coding, where each individual bee gets a specialized tag glued to it. And we can see a bee with that tag right here. And it looks a little bit like a QR code that most of us might be used to just like zapping on your phone. And that is, uh, it works in kind of the same way. This big square tells the co computer or a camera where the front left of the individual bee is. And then the rest of this encodes individualized information about the bee. And you can ID about 2000 different bees before you run out of space to code the numbers. And then we put these bees in a specialized colony. We can see this setup right here. They're kept inside with a port going outdoors, what we call an observation hive. But instead of a human carefully watching and writing down what individual marked bees do, we have this very fancy camera and infrared lights that shine on the colony. So honeybees and most insects can't see infrared light. And so to them, this is just darkness. But to the camera, it's very bright and it allows the camera to take very, very high quality photos. So most times people think I'm gonna show a video of this, but it's actually not a video. It's actually just taking individualized photos once a second. So it's making like a flip book of, um, of what's going on in that colony. And so this is what the image looks like. We have these thousands of bees. Each one's got that little white tag on them. If we zoom in, we can see the tag. And so the computer, um, the computer program now knows where every bee is and what direction they're facing and how far they are from any other bee. 
in the colony. And that, that's pretty cool. But then they actually took it a, a step farther with this system and it can also identify certain specific behaviors, not just guess. So for example, so the early, it, when the system was originally developed, it would think these two bees are probably sharing food because they're facing each other and they're really close to each other. But if we look at the photo, we see actually they're not. But in this top one, they are. One is sticking its tongue out and spitting food into the other one's mouth, which bees love to do. So how do we tell which is which? I'll come back to that in a second. Um, let me see. But I just want to show the picture. So one of the ways we can use this system is um, to take of this like thousand bees, we can introduce a subpopulation that are infected with our virus, say about 200, and we mix them all together. So they're one colony and we know all the bees who have been marked. And so we can measure then where they are, what they're doing, how far they moved, how fast they're moving and who they're interacting with for the entirety of an experiment. This is what it looks like under white light. So a human can see this is not being recorded. The bees are probably a little confused right now because they're in bright light. This is at the end of an experiment. Here again, we can see some of that trophallaxis, that mouth sharing, spitting back and forth behavior. Their little tongues are sticking out. So I can see it, you can see it. So a person watching this would be able to write this down, right? So how does a computer know? Has anybody ever used Google or something and it made you do a captcha like, prove you're a human and it and it shows you all these pictures and it says which one of these has a crosswalk in it and you got to pick uh this one has a crosswalk uh maybe this one has a crosswalk and what you're doing is you're training a computer to identify as like a gestalt like what is a crosswalk look like sometimes it's like pick pick one that has a car in it or a boat or whatever and you're training a computer and so some people here did the same thing with these trophallaxing bees. They went through like a million images, found trophallaxing bees, and then drew outlines showing, okay, this is the head and this is the proboscis, this, the little tongue they used to stick out. And so over thousands and thousands of iterations, they trained the computer to identify this behavior. Pretty cool. And because the computer is you know, all seeing and all knowing, it can see these events occurring throughout the entire colony, not just one at a time like a human observer could. And so I do have a short video showing how we put the tags on because everybody always asks about this. It's a uh, very, very, very time consuming and challenging. So here's a bee being held down very carefully, a little tiny dot of super glue to put on her back. And then very carefully, a little tiny barcode is just added. And it has to be on just right. So it's very challenging. But we can have people do that and you end up with around a thousand bees all having those little barcodes so we can track them all the time. So I don't like showing too many graphs, but I'll just throw this up there for anybody interested. When we take a colony full of a background population of bees, and then we introduce a subpopulation that's either just been kind of handled and put in those little cages or put in the cages and infected with, with the Israeli acute paralysis virus. We can track what they're doing for the entirety of the experiment. And in this case, about a week, we just see what do they do in there? How much of this face-to-face -face interaction do they have? And what we find is that if you compare infected bees with um, control bees, the bees who are infected um, interact in that way significantly less often than controls. And so again, this, this graph isn't the most exciting or the best way to, to really um, send this home, but I do like to show it a little bit just to show that it's not like the bees who are infected are paralyzed or feeling so sick they go and like lay down in the corner and don't interact. In fact, I don't show the data here, but the infected bees actually walk around and move around a little bit more than the infected bees, than the control bees do. So they're not paralyzed. They're not like so sick they don't move, but they exhibit this mouth to mouth spitting back and forth behavior significantly less. So I thought that's really cool. We see it in this colony over a long time. Well, you know, I'm an old fashioned kind of guy. And so I really wanted to know, well, what about other behaviors? 
they don't just do this one behavior where they spit. Bees have a million behaviors and they're all really interesting and they all do something and mean something. And so we did this experiment using the same treatments, but in what I call the old fashioned way. And that is by observing them in a little Petri dish and just doing it by with a human observer. And so we did this for a couple reasons. First is that human can observe a larger repertoire of behaviors. They can see that mouth to mouth sharing behavior. They can see just antenating, grooming. They can see if they're kind of fighting with each other. They can really record all these different behaviors. Also setting up those huge colony experiments is cool, but it's very difficult, very time consuming and very expensive. And so we wanted a, 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 another experiment that would be um, easier to do a large number of, of um, trials with to really make sure what we were seeing what replicated, that it's real, that we still see it happening. And so this was work done by a graduate student named Amy Geffrey, who's now at UC San Diego. Um, and so she spent a lot of time watching how bees behave in these dishes. Another thing that we were able to add um, in these experiments was another treatment. So right now we're looking at regular bees and bees that are infected with IAPB, this paralysis virus, and we see an effect. But is it because the bees are infected with a virus or is it like a fever? You know, if I get a fever, that doesn't tell me what I'm infected with, does it? Lots of different things can trigger a fever in a, in a human or a, a mammal. Lots of different things can trigger the social immune response that we see in social insects. And so this allowed us to do another treatment where we used um, double-stranded RNA, which we can talk about if people are interested. But basically what this did was simulate an infection. It's, it turned on the bee's immune system a little bit, but they're not actually sick. They're not actually infected with anything. So we wanted to see, is this a general response to a disease or is this you know, something really specific to this one virus? And I showed this graph just because it's so clear. We see that in uh, control bees, they get a lot of the mouth-to-mouth -mouth trophallaxis sharing behavior. But if a bee is either infected or just has its immune system stimulated, they experience about half as much. So a really huge reduction in how much the, the bee in a dish with them wants to share food, wants to touch them. So we see this very strong response that infected bees, no thanks. And so we can kind of sum this up. You know, if you have a bee, whether it's in a colony or in a little Petri dish that we use as an assay, there's all these other bees in there. And as they're interacting, they see this healthy bee and they think, okay, you're cool. Like you want some food, let's share food. And they spit food back and forth to each other as bees do. But if a bee is infected or is their immune system simulated, something is happening to make it so that the bees don't wanna share food with them. We don't actually know if this bee saying, stay away, I'm sick, or if the, background bees are saying, ooh, you're, you smell weird, no thank you, or if it's both. And we'll talk a little bit about how we might figure that out later. But what we do know is that this phenomenon does seem to happen. And again, this shouldn't surprise us. We know that social insects have to have these adaptations to be able to you know, deal with surprises uh, from, the, um, from pathogens. So why does this make sense? This is, I'm gonna pose this question to our chat. Like, why would, why would the bees do something that would benefit, um, that would, how, like, why would they do this and how would this be beneficial for protecting others? Especially if an infected bee gets less food, why would they do this? Um, why not just act normally? Is any, any ideas in the chat or other questions? What's the relationship between the bees and a colony? Does anyone remember or have thought about this? We have some answers coming in, Adam. Great. Um, Jennifer says to help slow down the spread. Uh, Hip says uh, not to get others sick. That's right. Yeah, so they, exactly. They, this would be beneficial because it's not going to spread as quickly. They're not going to be able to, to get as many sick. And so why would we see this being really beneficial? In this case, especially because everybody's related. Like 
another data reference of sister, sister, um, everybody uh, inside this colony, all the individual bees, all the worker bees are sisters. So they got to protect their sister or their mom in the case of the queen. And so, like I said, all social insect colonies or most social insect colonies, it's a big group of relatives. And the, the thing that reproduces, the one that actually makes babies is the queen, but it's really the colony as a whole reproducing, right? And so if a colony doesn't have the ability to deal with pathogens, that colony is gonna be very unsuccessful. But colonies that do have that ability, whether it's a stronger immune system inside their body or just behaviors that prevent pathogen spread, they're gonna be more successful they're gonna be selected for, and they're gonna be the phenotype that we see out there happening all the time. And so what we see in this example, because we, when, we, when we stimulate the immune system, these bees, they did the behavior, you know, whether it was from a real infection or just this chemical, it just shows us that bees are very responsive to having their immune system triggered. And when that happens, behaviors get turned on to change, their, to change the transmission of the pathogen. It doesn't matter really what the pathogen is. We see this with bacterial studies as well. If a bee's immune system is turned on, it's like, whoa, so I don't feel good. Somebody can tell, let's stop spreading disease amongst each other. So the bigger question here now is, how does disease spread to other colonies? So we see that there's this reduction inside of a colony, but what about other colonies? Well, first I need to talk about another related, be another behavior. So remember earlier, I mentioned that at, at the entrance of every colony are guard bees and they're standing guard ready to say, hey, you live here? No, then you gotta get out of here. But why would they even have that? Well, because bees do move between colonies in nature and in agricultural settings. One way they do so is what, from what we call drifting behavior. And this is where a foraging bee leaves a colony, they go out and they collect some food, and now it's time to come home. And, you know, we know bees are awesome navigators, they use a dance language to be able to find stuff. But all these bite boxes look pretty similar and they're really close to each other. So when a bee from this colony comes back, what happens if she lands like right here? Well, she gets interrogated by the guards, but is often let in and she's what we call a drifting bee. And depending on the size of the colonies and the time of year, that can happen kind of a lot. So we did an experiment using those barcoded bees again. And in addition to that camera inside the colony, we also had a much smaller camera inside this weird little box on the outside. This is where the bees were leaving the colony and going out just into nature to collect food. And so we had a little special camera here that was seeing when a bee left and when it returned. It was reading that code on their back, so it knew. And so the main thing we saw was that when a bee is infected, their foraging didn't change. They still left the colony and came back and foraged normally. They're not like paralyzed. They're not so sick that they can't move. They forage about the same frequency as a regular bee. So the potential for them to go out and accidentally go to another colony is pretty high. They're, they're, just, living, they're just living out there um, and flying in and out of colonies. But like I mentioned, bee colonies have these social defenses to keep out intruders. Here we can see some guard bees. Here's a bee landing. And as a guard bee um, is alerted to a new bee coming in, they were gonna, they're going to stop and physically contact that bee and then do something to them to see, are you, uh, are you, do you belong here or not? And we can do this in two different ways. One is with experiments on a real hive entrance but we can also do them inside the laboratory with bees in little boxes. And so first we did an experiment where we simulate guard bees with what we call an intruder assay. And so what that means is we take just a bunch of bees of the right age or bees from the front of a real colony, we put them in little boxes, and then we can just put a bee in there with them and see what happens. And so we can use those same treatments where we take a regular bee, an infected bee, or a bee who has its immune system turned on and just pop them in there with those other bees and see what happens. Again, I show this just because it is kind of a dramatic effect. Um, but basically what we see is that control bees, they get attacked a lot um, by those bees inside the cages. They're a bee from another colony. 
They don't belong there and the bees don't like it. That's what we're seeing here. However, if the bee is infected, they get attacked almost never, very infrequently. And instead they get, um, they get food given to them. The guard bees, instead of attacking them, actually just spit food back and forth with them instead. So like the exact opposite of what the guard bee is supposed to be doing. So like, that's bad. If you're trying to prevent a diseased individual from coming into your colony, um, letting them in and like spitting back and forth to them seems like a bad move. But what happens in the real, in real, in the real world and with real life? And so this is the front of a real colony. And this is an example from another study actually, um, but we did the same thing for ours, where we can just record what happens and kind of figure out you know, what, what the other bees are doing to the focal individual. And so here we have this little green mark bee, and this is what we're gonna call a foreign intruder. Let's see if I can play the video. I'll turn the sound up. So we can see that little green bee. The guard bee is accosting her and, think, and saying like, Who, what are you doing here? And other guard bees are doing the same. And we can see they're antenating her and now they're also biting her and kind of dragging her around. And they're definitely not letting her in. You can see they're even like, buzzing on her and eventually trying to sting her and drag her out of the colony. And if we were to continue to watch this video, eventually um, she would be totally dragged. We can see her in this blob here. That B has got her leg in her mouth and she's dragging her away from the entrance. She does not like that foreign B. You don't live here, go away. On the other hand, in another example, we have a bee who's marked. The guard comes up to her and says, hey, who are you? And then they spit food back and forth between each other. And then they and the guard leaves and just leaves her alone. And so we can see it's a very dramatic difference if a bee is gonna be accepted or responded. And this is something that happens all day, every day, it's normal. When a new bee, when a bee comes back from collecting food, the guard bee checks her, says, who are you? Most of the time it's a bee from that colony. Most of the time the bee just gets let in. So when we do this experiment with our bees, the like a regular bee, which in this case is a foreign bee from another colony, so they should get attacked. An infected bee or a bee with its immune system turned on, again, we see a very dramatic effect. We see that bees who are infected with IAPV are more than twice as likely to get accepted into a foreign colony. Most of the bees um, that we put in front of a foreign colony get attacked about uh, a little more than 80% of them. Some do get in. This is always something that happens. Drifting behavior occurs. We expect that. But the vast majority of them are rejected. But if they're infected, they are much more likely to, be, to, get, um, to be get let in. And I'll point out here that this is an effect that only occurs for bees who are actually infected. The bees who just have their immune system turned on actually get attacked even more. So what the heck is different about these bees? I'll ask that in the chat. Like if you had to think like what, what would make a bee different to make these things happen? What were some things you might expect? What are things that could be changed to make this happen? Smell, Marianne suggesting smell. That's a good answer. Any other ideas? Sympathy for the bee. I'm not Ooh, quite sure. That's either. a good one. <laughs> uh, the way they act, the virus is causing some sort of behavioral yeah. change. Yeah, exactly. So those are all really, even the sympathy one kind of relate to the behavioral change, right? Like, so in a lot of social insects, when a individual is attacked, they do what are called appeasement behaviors, like, please don't hurt me. Here's some food. And so they can have behaviors that might say, like, have pity on me and let me into your, into the nest. I actually do belong here. And so, and, and I'll actually note, um, we're still working on figuring that out, actually, because I do think some of that is happening. But someone also someone mentioned how they smell. And that's a great answer because 
when we think about how guard bees can tell who is who and who gets allowed in the colony, they're using several things. They are taking behavior into account. So if a bee gives up some food or is very docile, she might get accepted even if she smells wrong. But if a bee comes in smelling wrong and is being belligerent, well, they're gonna get attacked, definitely. Guard bees predominantly use chemical cues to tell who is who. And lots of social insects do this. Um, I'm gonna say there's a lot of cool work on these chemical cues from Adrian Smith's lab and a lot of his previous work on ants. Um, and in a lot of these systems, we have a bunch of different um, chemicals that are on the outside of the, the, of the bee or ant that provide some information. Here's some very dry looking pictures of some of them, including these um, long chain hydrocarbons. And so we collectively just call these cuticular hydrocarbons. They're on the cuticle of the insect. Um, all insects have cuticle hydrocarbons um, originally as a way to prevent them from drying out. Like, you know, your skin has oil on it while their cuticle has these waxy secretions that protect them from drying out. But in a lot of insects, they also communicate information. And so that's what happens here. And in honeybees, it's, it's pretty complicated how these develop, but every, every bee colony has kind of like a specific odor made up of these chemical cues. And that allows the guard bees to tell who belongs there and who doesn't. And so when we looked at our experiments and we have these you know, guard bees hanging out and either a healthy bee or an infected bee that is dropped in amongst them, what do they smell like? And so we could do this experiment and take these individual bees and then wash off those chemicals, wash them off their body, and then put them through a machine that would help us identify what chemicals were there and how much of each one. And what, you know, we can, we first looked at, you know, just the normal healthy bee from a normal colony. And so here you can see my little cartoon pictures of different hydrocarbons, and they're in red because those bees um, from the colony, smell that he healthy bee, and they think, you don't smell right. You smell like you're from another colony, and they get attacked. No, thank you. But then, if you look at an infected bee, the, the hydrocarbon profile is a little bit different. And so, we don't know what, what chemical is doing what and which one's the most important, because some of those hydrocarbons are the same as the healthy bee, they didn't change. In fact, a lot of them are like that, but there are some, especially some chemicals that have been associated with telling who's who in other studies that are different between these bees. And so these bees smell different, the, the worker bees from the other colony treat them differently, and that results in that bee being able to enter into the colony, just be allowed in. So why does this make sense? Why would they, the response, the behavioral response be totally different in inside the colony versus outside the colonies? Why would bees be able to protect themselves from disease transmission within their colony, but then they do behaviors that increase the movement of pathogens to other colonies? Any other ideas in the chat? Why don't the sick bees protect their neighbors? Why don't they just go off and die or stop foraging? Or why don't the, the, the colonies attack them more? This is a tough one. The chat's pretty quiet on this. Yeah. <laughs> so this benefits the virus. The virus has won in this situation. While in the other context, the virus has lost and the bees have won. And what's the big difference? Inside the colony, sister, sister in there, everybody's related. But what about colonies that are just next to your next door neighbors? They're not related to them. So there's no selection to protect your neighbor. The B, co B colony A doesn't really benefit in its reproduction if B colony B gets a disease and dies. If anything, you might even argue that it would be better for that first colony because that's a competitor. They're competing with each other out in, you know, out in the na nature for flowers and things like that. Um, and if you're sick and your neighbor isn't, well, that's not very good for you. 
And so we think there's very little selection for bees to wanna to protect their unrelated neighbor colonies. Why would they do that? While protecting their inside the colony, protecting their sisters and their mother, very valuable. And so kind of in summary, inside of a colony, when bees are, have their immune system turned on, no matter what it's from, they reduce, they do things that we think reduces transmission within their group, within their family. However, when bees are infected, it, with some systems, they can forge at a higher rate. Um, but then if they go into other colonies, they're let in, and they're groomed and kind of treated very nicely rather than being attacked. So to kind of come back to one of our first questions about how bees live and what a bee colony looks like, where would this strategy succeed? If you were the virus and you wanted to reproduce, where would it benefit you to make bees go between colonies like this? Would it be in an area that looks like this in nature? Because again, Honeybee colonies in nature live in hollow trees or similar kind of very special places, a hollow tree or a rock hollow or something like that. And in a big forest like this, where there's a lot of trees, how many are going to have tree holes, just the right size for bees to be able to move in? Not very many. Adam, we have a lot of folks saying in hives, farms, or in those closed boxes that you showed. Yeah, great answers. Yeah, exactly. So in nature, we might not expect this to happen very often because um, we know from a surprisingly few studies, because honeybees are primarily studied as managed pollinators, not as wild animals. But in the studies that have done so, they estimate that there's about one bee colony per square kilometer. So they're not very close to each other at all. And in fact, they may be why we see so much drifting behavior when bees are kept like this. Because in nature, they would almost never be right next to each other. And they certainly would never be at the densities that we see in managed apiaries. You know, here we can see these little boxes. Each one of these is a colony. And up here, we see even more. Both of these are what are on what we call pallets. And so each of these squares that you can see is actually four colonies that are all stacked together on a shipping pallet. And so you can quickly see like this is hundreds of colonies all kept next to each other. We still, we have, you know, 50 or so colonies here all kept right next to each other. And so we think this is an example of where a pathogen, uh, especially a virus like this that can evolve very quickly is taking advantage of a management system that humans created that kind of circumvents the biology of the, of the animal. And in nature, honeybees would not need to have strong defenses um, to protect against individ like infected individuals going between colonies. And similarly, in nature, a virus wouldn't benefit that much from doing so because if you live up in this tree, the chances you're gonna accidentally go to the wrong colony are pretty low. But if you live in these white boxes that are all right next to each other, very high likelihood of accidentally going to the wrong colony and it benefiting the virus to be able to move that way. And so that's kind of where I wanna wrap up this story um, and talk about what I think is, is so cool about this, um, that with honeybees, because they're this super organism, we can have their interaction with a pathogen be basically opposite. That we have an example of very strong uh, incentive to protect the individuals within your colony. Bees have been, having to do those behaviors through their evolution of over you know, hundreds of millions of years. And so we see this generalized response that way. However, honeybees have only been kept at high densities for a relatively short amount of time. You know, modern removable frame beekeeping was only invented in the mid 1800s. Um, and the modern form of moving colonies at really high density has only been around for like 40 or 50 years. Um, and so we see this as an example where human management likely selected for a virus that can make these changes happen in a relatively recent um, window of time. And so this has some kind of cool repercussions on how we view um, honeybee management and how we view 
how pathogens move around in the landscape. I didn't talk about this, but one of the other things that we're really interested in with the system is how do these virus, uh, viral diseases then maybe spread to other bee species that, um, that interact with honeybees in these contexts but aren't managed. Um, and so I think it's a, really, um, it's a really interesting system that we continue to work on. And so I'll just acknowledge we had some cool funding from USDA and NSF to do some of this work. And then a lot of people in my lab helped do it. Um, and hopefully we have a few more time, a few, few minutes for some, um, some questions or discussion if anyone wants to, uh, to talk more. Thanks, Adam. That was great. I had very thorough. I was writing down questions to ask you and then you would answer them all. Uh, but we, we do have a bunch of questions that came in through the chat. Um, first of all, I, I, one thing I want to know is in these lab experiments that you're doing, are those wild caught bees or bees that you'd find in more like this agricultural setting? Yeah, so these are all um, these are all like commercial style bees. These are bees that were produced by our apiary or bees that we purchased from beekeepers. You know, bees in the United States are all going to be introduced, um, and in much of the Midwest, where where I live, there aren't a lot of feral colonies that you can just go catch. It's it's all going to be like from ag stock. Okay, um, and then Nikki was wondering how effective are beekeeper suits, and do you have to wear any sort of protection while you're doing these experiments? Yeah, it's a good question. So you know, again, luxury of being in the Midwest, we don't have. Hi, any hyper aggressive versions or hyper defensive bee breeds or varieties. And so most of us usually just wear um, what we call a bee jacket. It's like the top half of a bee suit and you know you wear pants. Um, but a lot of times we just wear a veil and a t-shirt. Many of our bees are pretty gentle, but it really is, I, what I like is it's a personal preference thing. And there's, you can go from doing the whole space suit route where you're wearing like big gloves and boots and everything's taped up. You're never gonna get stung. Um, versus, you know, that makes me too hot. And so uh, you can wear less and you're more likely to get stung. Um, but we don't, there's people I know who worked on bees for you know, years and get stung once a year or, or almost never. And uh, kind of related to that, JP was wondering, um, going back to the picture where you showed the different types of hives, um, how did those hornets get to the United States? Oh, European hornets. Um, so a lot of those types of wasps, you know, a honeybee colony goes through the winter as a colony, right? There's thousands of individuals are in the thing. So you kind of have to bring those on purpose. Um, but a lot of wasps, including European hornets, they're, they are annual, they only live one year. And then at the end of the year, they produce a bunch of new queens. Those queens go out and hibernate by them. You know, they just like hang out by themselves. And so a wasp queen like that could easily get on a ship in cargo, get moved across the ocean. And then in the spring, you're in America and you're just your one wasp, you go out and you found a new colony. Um, and they've been here for a really long time, European hornets. All right, let's see, a lot of good questions coming in now. Um, what happens to the hydrocarbon profile of the double-stranded RNA bees? Yeah, that's a good question. It's, it's weird. They're also different. And so I didn't show a graph of this, but basically all three of those groups, infected, DSRNA, or control, they all have their own kind of unique smell, but we don't really know what does what. And it's, um, like I said, it's kind of complicated in honeybees. There's not just like one master chemical that controls if you're enter, you know, a key entry or not. Um, and so we don't know what the individual chemicals do. The infected bees have some things that are like the DSRNA bees and some things that are like the regular bees and they have some things that are unique to themselves. And so all three are a bit different. All right, and then the Bruins family wants to know, is there a cure for the pathogen? Good question. So, you know, as we all know, treating viral infections is, is difficult. There's no, you know, antibiotics don't affect them. Um, there have been some treatments in the last few years that have been kind of produced experimentally. They have, they're not on the market for beekeepers, at least yet. They actually use DSRNA as a treatment kind of to prevent virus infection. Basically, you would feed it to bees to stimulate their immune response to a specific virus. And so if they then encounter that virus, 
they would be primed and ready to fight it off, kind of like a vaccine would work. Unfortunately, yeah, these aren't really, those aren't on the market as of now. Um, the way that we normally deal with bees that have virus infections is controlling the parasitic mites that spread the infection is really important. They reproduce very quickly. They're very challenging to deal with. Um, and then my lab, as well as some others, have shown evidence that some virus infections can be kind of reduced in severity just by increasing the nutrition of the bees. And so we often feed them, make sure they have enough food, trying to figure out like what, what kind of food is the best for them. Um, in fact, there's a, a student in my lab who recently showed that you can reduce the number of bees who die of infection by feeding them sugar solution with caffeine in it. So just a little bit of caffeine can help, could help them, which is, sounds crazy, but there's actually a lot of flowers that have caffeine in their nectar. Interesting. Um, let's see. Danny wants to know if putting the barcodes on hurts the bees. It does not appear to hurt them. Um, they're, you know, we look like they're holding them down and we do this on bees as soon as they emerge out of their pupil stage, like a, you know, a caterpillar pops out of the cocoon and those bees cannot um, fly and they cannot sting and they're very kind of clumsy. And so you can just kind of, we keep them kind of on the cold side so they, they're not as active because they're cold blooded. And then you just glue this on there and they'll live their normal lifespan and act really normally with that on there. All right, and then uh, Dr. Smith was asking, is there a seasonal component to the bee disease? What happens when the hive is overwintering? Is there a honeybee flu season? That's a really good question. And the answer is kind of, yeah, there is. Um, and in, in most beekeeping, we see it associated with booms in the varroa population and these mites. And that actually starts to occur um, in kind of these temperate climates around like August. And it's because that's when, so bee colonies produce a lot of bees in the spring and early summer, and then they, to collect all the food, and then they start to decline in population to go in the winter, and that's natural. And as the number, as they start to decline, the number of mites that are there stays the same. So the number of mites per bee increases. And so that's when you start to have like a lot of pathogen pressure. Um, and if you were to not do anything as a beekeeper, when a hive got that infested and infected, it would almost certainly die and become just like this hotbed of infection during the, during the winter. Um, and so most management we do is to try to minimize, like before the bees like go into the winter, as minimal number of mites, as minimal evidence of disease as possible. Cause yeah, like, like you, you know, know, once they're in there for the winter, they're like, they're like in there, it's like they're snowed in and they don't leave. And so any disease in there is kind of trapped in there with them. Thank you. Then uh, HIP is asking, how can you tell if um, maybe it's the lab environment that is changing the bee behavior? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and always a valuable one to bring up. So, you know, on one hand, we always have controls. And so if it's a lab a specific effect, then the control should show us that. Um, but that's why in our best studies, we always are doing experiments in the lab and something in the field, just because, you know, a cage with 30 bees in it is not a bee colony. And we know that, you know, a bee colony should have tens of thousands of individuals. And so in that example, we have these Petri dish experiments, which other people have done studies that have showed very clearly that these lab assays we do they mirror what happens in the field. And there, there are older studies where people compared very carefully these particular assays in the lab and in the field. But then that's why we do the inside of a colony experiment. And that's why we did those colony entrance experiments. Because that's a real, because that's, that's exactly the question we had. Like, who cares what happens in a Petri dish? What happens in a real colony? And to me, like, that's what really kind of put, you know, hit, drove the, the, the nail home was that, that finding. All right, so uh, we're just about out of time. Two more questions. Let's see how quickly you can answer these. Sure. Uh, does this virus affect other bee species, particularly native species? Yeah, so there's evidence that IAPV uh, infects several different bumblebee species. Um, and it's like, so 
it's likely to have some transmissibility between them. But other bee species, we haven't published this, but we've tested it in my lab. They appear to not, at least they don't die of the infection. They may still carry it though. And there are other honeybee viruses that definitely are very broad and likely infect many or most other bee species. All right, and then Rebecca of Masters asks, how can I teach my first grade class to love and respect bees, not to be afraid of them? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, if there was ever a time where people liked bees, it's now, um, you know, 25 years ago, that would have been really hard, I think. Um, I think it's, you know, just seeing them on flowers is so much fun. And you can really see that they're not interested, you know, that they're helping the flower and they're there and, and, and they're really, I think, very attractive. But also note that that bee is just there eating lunch and they're not, um, they're not really interested in, in stinging you unless you try to eat it. So I have two young kids and that's the way I always say it is like the bee, the bee doesn't want to hurt you unless you're trying to eat it, or at least it thinks you're trying to eat it. And so just don't do anything that the bee might interpret as you trying to eat it, like catching it in your hand or putting it in your mouth. Those are bad moves. Uh, or if it's a bee colony, like shaking the box. But for the most part, those bees just want to leave. They want to, they want to be left alone and eat their flower meal and go home and take care of their babies and give some flower or, you know, their the flowers pollen to their little larva that they're raising. And, you know, if they don't make it home that, that one, those larvae die. So as long as you don't want to eat them, they're, they're generally not going to hurt you. Great. Dr. Dalzal, thanks again for such a thorough and fascinating talk. Um, thank you for everybody who attended. If you want to learn more about bees and native bees to North Carolina, and how to teach your first grade class, how to love and respect them, you can tune in to the rest of the BugFest programming. We have programs today through Thursday. Uh, we've dropped the links in the chat for you to find the, the whole schedule of those events. Um, if you want to get one of these awesome BugFest t-shirts, check out our museum store. If you join or renew your membership, you can get one for free. Um, again, thank you, Dr. Dalzal, and thank you for everybody for uh, paying attention and asking such great questions. Y'all yeah, have a nice day. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks have for a, showing up. Thank you. Good luck, Fest. Bye.